Logan, and welcome to A Little Book Open on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Pastor John Anderson, and we are discovering a picture of God, a picture of God's character through the study of the book of Daniel. That is the little book that we are talking about mentioned in our title, and I hope that you've been uh, tuning in with us week by week as we go through some introductory material here, getting into the study of this wonderful book. I'd like to invite you to pray with me now as we open our study today. Father in heaven, thank you once again that you have given to us this wonderful book, a book that opens to our view a picture of life, shows us your plan and the ultimate victory of your kingdom. And Lord, today we ask for your presence as we continue our study. Be with each viewer, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. What we've discovered uh, so far in our study is that there are a number of themes that uh, pervade through the book of Daniel. God loves, God knows, God is involved and acts, and ultimately God is acting, bringing the world to a point of climax when he will step in and, and uh, his kingdom will triumph, and God wants every single one of us to be a part of that victory. And I hope that you are already a committed Christian and you have given your heart to Jesus. If you have not may I appeal to you to do just that, because that will put you on the winning team. That will give you answers to why things are happening in this life that seem so perplexing, uh, so unanswerable. But the Bible has the answers, and the book of Daniel, particularly the book that we're studying, opens our view so that we can grasp and understand some things that go on in this life. Where we left off last time was that we were talking about the covenant relationship between God and his people. When sin came in, Satan thought that he had gained access to everything, that the whole world belonged to him. But God said, no, uh, that's not, was the, not, not the way it's going to happen. I'm going to put some, some checks on what you can do. Otherwise, Satan would just destroy everyone. And so to every person, whether they are a believer or not, some benefits of God's plan extend toward them. The Bible says he sends his son to rise on the the, the righteous as well as the wicked, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and so on. There is some level of protection that's given to everyone, but to those who commit their ways to him, God brings into a special relationship defined by what the Bible calls his covenant, and that adds another layer of protection and gives to us insight into his wisdom. So how important it is to be in relationship with God, to receive the benefits of those, as well as have uh, a hope for the future so that when Jesus comes, he'll take us home. But even in this life, uh, we have the benefits of his protection uh, against the evil one. This covenant, though, uh, has conditions to it. And a very important small word is contained in the language when you read about the covenant in the Bible. That's the word that is the word if. If you follow me, if you keep my commandments, if you obey me, if you love me, then I will extend to you the blessings of the covenant. But if you forsake me, if you rebel against me, if you transgress my commandments, then the blessings are removed, which is another way of saying a curse comes upon us. So this conditional aspect of the covenant benefits is something that we have to understand and helps us understand how the book of Daniel opens when it says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Why would God do such a thing? Why would God give the king of Judah and the nation of Judah, the territory of Judea, into the hand of the king of Babylon? Well, we have to understand this matter of the covenant relationship that God set up uh, with, with his creatures, that if we obey, then blessings and protection. If we disobey, if we push God away, we forfeit his his protection. That's the, the basic premise that we are, are being taught here in the scriptures. So this covenant relationship existed uh, going way back when. Now we, we have to understand that what I've just said needs to be taken in a, in a general way. What do I mean by that? That is to say that blessings come through obedience and trial and uh, disaster come through disobedience. That is, that is understood and experienced in a general way. There are exceptions. We live in a wicked world, and sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes the wicked prosper. But in a general way, the covenant still describes how if we follow the Lord, his blessings will attend our way. 
It is good to follow the Lord. I will, I will give you my personal testimony on that. There is another aspect of that what we need to understand and clarify in regard to this, and that is the blessings are conditional upon our obedience. God's love is unconditional. It never changes. His love is unconditional. His blessings are conditioned on how we live up to the terms of the, of the covenant. And that, that theme runs like a, a, a silver thread through the entire Old Testament scripture and goes on into the New Testament as well. So there are exceptions, and we see in the life of Job where the devil was given access by God's permission to torment him and afflict him. But in a general way, blessings come to those who follow the Lord. Now, as, as the time rolled, rolled by, as centuries came and went, the Lord foresaw the need to carve out a special place where his people could live and follow him and use that as a, a hub, a center point. And the territory that the Lord chose was the land of Canaan, Palestine. So he brought Abram at that time, that was the name that he went by. He brought him from Babylonia, the Ur of the Chaldees, and he set him there in, in Palestine. But Abraham was a pilgrim. God's purpose was to chart out this territory so that his people in succeeding generations would be able to occupy that territory and preserve it from the evil influences of idolatry and violence and wickedness. That would be God's land. That would be his territory. But it was to be used as a hub to witness from. And even when Abram came to Canaan, he was not a possessor of the land. He was a pilgrim. Because the Lord said, the people who now live here, the Amorites, have not yet had an opportunity to make a decision for me or against me. So we are going to allow them a period of time. It turned out to be 400 years of time. We're going to allow them a period of time to see if they will see the benefits of righteousness and become a part of my kingdom or not. If they chose not to, after having 400 years of probation, then the Lord deemed it fair and just to dispossess them of that land and put his people in there where they would live. So that's what's happening there in the book of Genesis. Abram comes, he is a pilgrim, he wanders through the uh, territory, planting his altars wherever he goes, meeting with the people, sharing them the truth about the creator God, encouraging them to leave, leave aside the uh, worthless worship of idols and, and uh, so on, and to become part of God's family. Because God was reaching out to all those people. 400 years goes by. The Amorites choose not to accept God's plan and become a part of his kingdom. And so the Lord brings Israel out of Egypt after their term of bondage there. And he is, is uh, going to bring them to the promised land, as it was called, for the purpose of them establishing his kingdom there, from which they could witness to his honor and his glory and his love to uh, all the peoples that surrounded there. But we have to understand that since the Amorites, the indigenous peoples of Canaan, had forfeited their opportunity to be part of God's family and accept his ways, the Lord was going to remove protection from them. And they would be an easy prey for Israel, even though they might have bigger armies, they might have superior weapons, they might have greater experience in warfare. It didn't matter. This is part of the divine perspective that we're trying to grasp as we launch into the study of the book of Daniel that opens to our view this concept, this principle. And the point is that, that even though they might have had bigger armies, God being with Israel would give them the victory because they have forfeited their protection. Now we're going to read some verses from the Bible. I hope you have your, your pencil handy and your Bible open. We're going to read, first of all, from... Uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, tells us about how the Lord was going to give a period of time to the Amorites in which they could choose to follow him and uh, become part of his kingdom. Genesis 15, verse 16. The Lord told Abraham, you are not going to be the real owner of this land yet. He says, in the fourth generation, your descendants will return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So the Lord was giving a chance to them. He says, 
We're watching, we're waiting, we're hoping that they will learn and follow and apply. But if after 400 years that doesn't happen and their cup of iniquity is full, then they are justly to be uh, deemed uh, eligible to be dispossessed. Israelites will occupy that territory instead of them. And when that happens, even though they might have bigger armies, my presence being you, with you will give victory. So when the Israelites came up to the borders of, of the land, the spies went in and checked it out, you remember? They came back, and I want you to notice uh, what, what Joshua had to say uh, in that circumstance. Remember the ten spies said, no, we can't, we can't occupy the land. The people there are giants. We, we can't fight against them. Well, that was looking at things without the divine perspective. They did not understand. They did not grasp the principle that we're talking about here. But Joshua did. He said, do not rebel against the Lord. This is Numbers 14, verse 9. Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. They are our bread. They're going to be easy prey. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. For 400 years, God had been protecting them to give them an opportunity to make a choice. But now that they forfeited it, Joshua recognized that, that uh, uh, they would be easy prey, even though their armies might have been bigger and so on. Now, they, the congregation accepted the uh, message of the ten spies. and They said, no, we can't do it. They failed to subscribe to that basic principle of the divine perspective that, that uh, with God with them, they would be a majority. So they, they wandered in the wilderness for altogether, it was 40 years, it was 38 and a half more years that they wandered in the wilderness. But when they came back, uh, Moses had some words again to encourage them to go into the land that God would be with them, their protection has been forfeited and gone, and they would be victorious. Here's what he said in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 7, verse 24. He, God, he will deliver their kings into your hand. Now, recognize that that's almost verbatim, the same language you're reading in Daniel 1, only in Daniel 1 it's relating to Israel. Here it's relating to the Amorites. He will deliver, deliver you, their kings into your hand. You will destroy their name from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. So this was an expression of this divine perspective principle at work. That only with God's protection can uh, safety be assured. And once that protection is removed, as it is going to be done in this case with the Amorites, the indigenous people of Canaan, then they were ripe for destruction. Continuing also in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 25, no man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, just as he said to you. And again, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. So this is part of this concept that the book of Daniel um, opens to our view, that uh, Satan gained access to this world, but God brought protection. But once that protect, protection is removed and forfeited by rebellion, then the result is disaster. So when we read in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, then our minds are brought back to how this principle was at play in favor of Israel, against the Amorites when they occupied the territory. But centuries later, as we are going to see through persistent rebellion, that principle is going to be applied to them as well. And if they continue to rebel and uh, uh, transgress against the covenant terms, then the protection that had been so graciously given to them will be removed and Babylon will succeed. Let's turn our attention for just a moment to God's purpose in bringing Israel into Canaan. And uh, again, this is, serves as backdrop material to understand what Daniel is talking about. He brought them in there not to be exclusive, not to be hermits, not to live in some kind of existence where they had no contact with other people. He brought them into that place and strategically located Jerusalem as the capital because it was at the crossroads of commerce. There would be travelers, there would be caravans that would be coming through and there would be opportunity for interaction between the people that were out there and the people within Canaan, God's covenant people. The purpose of that interaction was to acquaint 
through the testimony, the witness of God's people, acquaint other people with knowledge of the true God, the creator God, because God's love uh, extends to every inhabitant of the world. It wasn't exclusively given to the Jews, even though mistakenly they came to think that later. But that was not what God wanted. He wanted to bless them so that they could be a blessing to others. Notice in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, how this is expressed. Abram was called from Babylonia, the Ur of the Chaldees, and he was told, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. So that was God, what God's purpose was. He was going to open the windows of heaven, as, so to speak, and pour blessings out upon Abram, not so that Abram could relax in his uh, exclusive, affluent way of life uh, and become uh, a hermit that way. No, so Abraham could bless others and teach others and lead others to know God because God wanted everybody to be saved. When Jesus came to this world and died on the cross, he carried with him the sins of every single person, no matter what their national heritage might have been. So that was God's purpose, to bless Abram so that he could be a blessing to others. We find this beautifully illustrated in the story of the feeding of the multitudes. You remember when uh, Jesus sat there by the shores of Galilee and taught and multitudes gathered, 5,000 men, probably an equal number of women and children, so probably 15,000 people there. And now it comes dinner time. What are we going to feed them? And one of the disciples said, well, I saw a little boy here. He had a little lunch with him, but it's only five loaves and two fishes. But what happened? Put in the hands of Jesus and, and blessed by him, those five loaves and two, fi two fishes fed the entire multitude with 12 baskets left over. But for a moment, picture the role of the disciples in that, in that story. They were blessed so that they could be a blessing. They received from Jesus the bread, the fish, and then they turned around and shared it with the others. That was to be a synopsis, an example of how God wanted to use Israel throughout the entire Old Testament period, blessed so that they could be a blessing. And we find that in the cases of the early patriarchs there, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on, God poured abundant blessings upon them. Look what it says here in the Bible in, uh, in the case of, of Abraham. Pardon me, this uh, text is referring actually to uh, his son Isaac. It says, the man began to prosper. I like the way this is expressed in this verse. He began to prosper. Isaac began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Well, that's, that's the blessing of the Lord brought upon Isaac. But it wasn't so that he could just be rich and relax on his own. It was so that he could bless others. And we find that uh, this was recognized by people of the community. Look at what uh, one of his neighboring princes, Abimelech, said, I'm reading from Genesis 26, verse 28. He said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. That's the object of Christian witnessing, isn't it? That others see that the Lord is with us. That's what happened in the book of Acts as the apostles went out and, and blazed the news of the resur resur resurrected Christ. People took note of them, it says, that they had been with Jesus. They said, yes, there's something about these people that's different. And it was the love of God shining through them. That was God's plan A for witnessing uh, through his people. By blessing them, they could be a blessing to others. Now, pause here for just a second. That's the backdrop of the book of Daniel 2,500 years ago. But it is still God's plan today. And it's God's plan for you and for me. God wants to pour out his blessings upon you and upon me and offer us the opportunity to acknowledge him as the giver of all these wonderful blessings and gifts so that our friends and our neighbors, our family, our workmates, whoever it may be, who does not know God, who does not walk with the Lord, can see that there is a difference in becoming a Christian. And it gives us an opportunity to express that with our mouth. And there's a very simple way that we can do that, and that is by using words that are key words, that our hearers will recognize as meaning that we are part of God's family. We are in a covenant relationship with God. He blesses us, and we want to bless others by sharing the truth about God with them. What are some of those words? 
Well, I'm going to recommend to you that you eliminate two words from your vocabulary. These two words Christians should never use. What are those words? Lucky and fortunate. Now think about those two words. I know they're easy to say, and they may come out uh, inadvertently when something good happens to us, and, and we say, oh, I was really fortunate that whatever it was. Or I was lucky that whatever it was. A Christian should never say that, because we do not believe that we're governed by luck or fortune. We are guided by the hand of Almighty God, and he is the one that brings blessings to us and saves us uh, when we're in a dangerous situation or blesses us when we get a, a job promotion or whatever it might be. So what, instead of saying, yes, I was really fortunate or I was really lucky, we can say I was blessed. And we can say it was providential that this happened this way. And in that way, we will be giving honor and acknowledgement to our Lord. And we will be telling who it is we're, whoever it is that we're talking to that we believe that there is a God who is involved in our life. The same God that that acts and knows and loves that we're reading about in Daniel is in my life too. And I want you to know him. That's the message when you use the words blessing and providential rather than fortunate and lucky. That's how God wanted to witness to the world through Israel by bringing them into the Canaan land and they would be in this covenant relationship with him. They would be obeying and loving and serving him, refraining from the worship of idolatry, staying away from transgressing the other commandments and so on. And neighbors would see it. And they would say, wow, this is a very prosperous people. How come? Why are they so blessed? Why are their crops doing so well? Why are their flocks uh, multiplying so, so uh, magnificently? And that would give Israel an opportunity to share the truth of their God and invite other people to enter into a covenant relationship with him. Enjoy the blessings that God has for us now as well as looking forward to the great hereafter when Jesus will come back and take us to heaven. So the Lord blessed Abraham exceedingly. He blessed Isaac exceedingly. He blessed Jacob exceedingly. And as long as that uh, system operated, as long as the people remained faithful in their covenant relationship and uh, expressed their acknowledgement by sharing with their friends, then witnessing could take place on a very simple but effective level. That was God's plan A. Now we find an illustration of when this worked. In the Old Testament, I'm reading from 1 Kings chapter 10. It's the story of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba has heard about Solomon. The Lord has blessed Solomon abundantly with wealth, with fame, with wisdom, and so on. Queen of Sheba hears about it. So she makes a trip. She wants to find out more about this. So she travels to Jerusalem and uh, she poses to Solomon some hard questions to see uh, about his wisdom, to see how, how uh, the depth of his understanding. Now, here's what she says after she has had a chance to interview Solomon and uh, witness what's going on there. Listen to her words very carefully. 1 Kings chapter 10, reading verses 1, 6, and 7. She says, It was a true report that I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw it with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the, f the fame of which I heard. This is witnessing. It's telling other people about God and how he blesses. And what a beautiful thing it is to be in a covenant relationship with him. And Solomon, at that point of his life, was exercising that and giving glory to God. But you know, it's only one chapter later that the story turns sour. And King Solomon, who had been honored by the Lord appearing to him twice, turned his back and forsook the terms of the covenant, began intermarrying with pagan wives and introducing their forms of worship into Israel and thereby transgressing. And what happens when we transgress against God? We forfeit his presence and we forfeit his protection. You have to understand this in order to see what Daniel 1 is saying when it says the Lord gave Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So we read in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord his God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. This is so sad because uh, just in the chapter before that, the Queen of Sheba had seen 
how the blessings of the Lord have been poured upon Solomon, and she traveled there. She came herself to find out more about it. That is the uh, modus operandi that God would like to use with us to witness, to bless us and then give us an opportunity to share the truth about the God that we worship. Now, we find that, well, that there were, there were occasions when it worked well. There were occasions when it actually happened that God's people gave credit to God in witness form. Sad to say, uh, the opposite was true most of the time. And we find a story in, uh, having to do with King Hezekiah that illustrates that in a negative way. What happened there? Hezekiah got sick. And Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, set your house in order, you're going to die. Rather than accept the word of the Lord, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed and asked God to extend his life. And the Lord said, I'm going to do it and I'm going to give you a sign. The sundial will turn back 10 degrees. Well, obviously, in order for that to happen, the Lord took his hand and adjusted planet Earth a little bit and there was a little bit of daylight savings that day. Well, this is not something that is confined just to one part of the globe. Every people around the world who are watching their sundials notice that something happened. And in Babylonia, those who took note of the events of the sky noticed this. And they said, what happened? Did you see that? The sundial went back. Who could answer why that happened? They said, maybe, maybe the Hebrews have an answer. So they sent, they sent messengers to Jerusalem to inquire what happened. What an opportunity for Hezekiah to witness that all, not only the God he served is one who can heal sickness, which God did and extended his life by 15 years, but is one who controls the very uh, planet Earth and all of the heavens. And that same God, Hezekiah could have said, wants to be your God. And if you will set aside your pagan worship and turn to him as the creator God, he will bless you. And you can be part of this wonderful covenant relationship. I'm sure the angels were standing nearby with cupped ears, waiting to hear what Hezekiah would say. But he is, his lips were closed with respect to that. He, the ambassadors came. They saw all that was in Hezekiah's house, all of his treasures. But he didn't say one word about the God who heals and can, is in control of all nature. And that one episode serves as a token of the failure of Israel in Old Testament times to live up to the, co the covenant conditions so that God could bless them and then they could share the news with others. Knowing this helps, is going to help us understand why it was later that it says in Daniel 1, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of the king of Babylon. My appeal to you today is follow the Lord. Obey his commandments. Allow him to bless you. And then acknowledge his blessings with others and lead them to an understanding of the true God who wants to love and save and bless them just, just as well. And one day, as Daniel is telling us, this will all be over and Jesus will take us home.